Catherine Patterson is the author of more than 30 books, including 60 novels for children and young people. She has twice won the Newbery Medal for The Bridge to Terabithia in 1978 and Jacob Have I Loved in 1981. The Master Puppeteer won the National Book Award in 1977, and the Great, Billy, the Great Gilly Hopkins won the National Book Award in 1979, and was also a Newbery Honor Book and the recipient of a Christopher Award. For her body of work, she has received the Hans Christian Andersen Award in 1998, the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award in 2006, and the NSK Newstat Award in 2007. In 2000, the Library of Congress named her a living legend. Pretty appropriate. She, has, she is a vice president of the National Children's Book and Literacy Alliance and is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Vermont College of Fine Arts. She is an honorary lifetime member of the International Board of Books for Young People and is an Alita Cutts lifetime member of the U.S. section of the U.S. Board on Books for Young People. She served as the 2010-2011 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, and in 2001, she received the Governor's Award for Excellency in the Arts from the state of Vermont, where she has lived for nearly 30 years. Please welcome Katherine Patterson. to have a little sticker. I mean, my husband would put a little sticker in here and say, is the mic adjusted? And then he would say, do you have water? And then he would say, I love you. So he's not here to say he loves me, but I trust that you will take up uh, his uh, torch and, and uh, love me for who I am and what I am. And. Uh, uh, it sounds grander in the introduction than it is in real life, so. <laughs> but thank you for the introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight. I really, really appreciate your coming. Uh, we were driving up here, and at least, you, at least I'm not competing with the leaves, which get more beautiful the further north we come. Uh, so uh, we were able to see them until, until darkness tonight. It was a great thrill for me to receive the phone call to say that my book, Bread and Roses Two was going to be the Vermont Reads for two, uh, 2018, uh, because actually it's a very old book. It was published in 2006, and that doesn't mean it's a classic. It means it's like day old bread or uh, <laughs> that is, that's going to be removed. Uh, and, uh, if it had been written for adults, uh, it would already have been remaindered or uh, chopped up and sent to the recycling. Fortunately, it's written for children, they hang around longer. Uh, it's been selling moderately well uh, these last 12 years or so, but you're giving it new life, and I do appreciate that. Uh, 2006 was a rather amazing year for me. Um, I, when it was the same year, of course, that Bread and Roses 2 was published. Is this working? No. no. I just turned it off by moving this. <laughs> okay, you don't put your notebook on top of that. I just want to <laughs> learn something new. <clears throat> uh, it was... Uh, uh, in, it was published in, in the summer of 2006, but in the spring, I'd had a different phone call. Uh, it rang at six o'clock in the morning, and of course I thought it was something terrible, um, bad news, and uh, my husband thought it was yet again the wrong number for the taxi, in Barry. It was just one number off from the local taxi in Barry. <laughs> but it was neither one, it was a call from Sweden to tell me that uh, I had won the 2006 Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award. And uh, 
my children immediately, as soon as they got the word, they said, we don't know if we're invited or not, but we're all going to go to Sweden. Now I have a fairly large family. I have four children, seven grandchildren, various in-laws and outlaws, and uh, my editor and her husband wanted to go, and uh, my son's mother-in-law wanted to go, and so we arrived 21 strong <laughs> in Stockholm. I said rather shyly to someone, uh, how many people did Philip Pullman bring last year? And they said, one. <laughs> So I think the Pattersons became sort of a legend <laughs> in Stockholm. But of course, from the morning that she heard the news, my five-year-old granddaughter, who's now a very sophisticated senior in high school, but at that time she was all princess and all pink, and she heard that she was actually going to meet a real princess, and she got so excited she didn't know what to do. She began practicing her curtsy immediately, and I was a little bit apprehensive. I, you know, I didn't know what the protocol was for meeting the future crown uh, queen of, I mean, she was going to be the queen of, of uh, uh, Sweden someday, and so I asked the Larry Limpert, who was the chair of the jury, you know, how do you meet royalty? And he said, oh, give her a high five. <laughs> solicit other opinions <laughs> and, and everybody seemed to say you know she's very informal uh, you just follow her lead she probably just offered to shake your hand and that was what she actually did and she and I were s seated in the front uh, of this huge outdoor uh, arena and uh, so I got up the nerve to say to her, my grandchildren are very eager to meet you, but uh, would that be all right? And she said, well, of course, she said, but let's wait for the photographers. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that'd be thrilling. But somehow my seven grandchildren, ages four to 17, had some burning question they needed to ask their grandmother before the program began. So I could see them making their way down from the, their various seats in the audience uh, to come up and ask me what it was that they needed to ask me. And uh, of course, then I had to introduce them <laughs> to the Crown Princess who was uh, very gracious and she shook everyone's hand and made sure she knew their names and, and treated them as though they were uh, ambassadors from a friendly nation, and uh, they were feeling quite uh, happy by this time. And so when the uh, photographers arrived, they came rushing back to have their picture taken with their old friend, uh, <laughs> the Crown Princess. Uh, after the paparazzi had dispersed and it was time to go to the reception, um, my five-year-old granddaughter turned to her mother and she said, now are we famous? And her mother <laughs> assured her that she was. So she came over to me and took my hand and was skipping happily by my side uh, to the restaurant on the grounds where the reception for all of us famous people was being held. Uh, and then she saw on the table, as people were signing in, yet another picture of her grandmother. And you have to understand that the Swedes take this award very seriously. There were pictures of me all over the city. Every newspaper had a picture of me on the front page. Every magazine had a picture of me. And here was yet another picture of her grandmother. And then going up the steps, at the head of the steps, there was a huge picture of her grandmother, the size of her own front door almost. <laughs> she looked at that picture and she sighed. <sighs> and I said, are you tired of Nana? Jordan, and she said, yes. <laughs> well, who could blame her? I mean, grandmothers are not supposed to be famous. They're not supposed to be celebrities. But then you look at Astrid Lindgren. She was a grandmother. And there are statues of her around the city. They, they have her on postage stamps. They've 
inaugurated this huge award in her honor. And so you have to think about the Swedish people, how they honor children's books, and someone who wrote children's books. Of course, she wasn't simply a writer of children's books. She was an advocate for justice and peace, but who would have listened to her if she hadn't written Pippi Longstocking? Uh, I can't talk about heroes uh, without revisiting them, probably the most unlikely hero of my life. And before I tell the story of Eugene Hammett, I have to ask how many people here have yet to hear the story of Eugene Hammett? If you have never heard me tell, oh, that's a great relief because <laughs> I've sworn to tell the story as long as one hand goes up. Well, the story set with, in what was probably the most difficult and unhappiest year of my childhood, the year that I was nine years old. We had left China. I was born in China, did we say that? Uh, and, and we left China in late 1940 after the Japanese invasion. I used to say we had refugee, but my editors had told me it was not a verb although it certainly felt like a verb when you were doing it so much. Uh, first, we moved in with relatives. Of course, we had no place to go. And then into this tiny apartment where uh, my sister and I were started out on our parents' bed and then moved to the living room couch. And my brother was sent off to live with relatives temporarily because there was no room uh, for him. Uh, and then, we, later that fall, we moved to Winston-Salem, I guess it was November, we moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where my father had found work in the church there. And I was enrolled in the fourth grade at Calvin H. Wiley School. Now, the fourth grade was a time of fear and humiliation for me. And I recognize that some of my best writing comes out of that awful year but I can't remember a single time saying to my nine-year-old self, buck up, old girl. Someday you're gonna make a mint out of all this misery. <laughs> <laughs> there were, however, a few people that I remember with great fondness from that awful year. The librarian at Calvin H. Wiley School who made the library a, a place of comfort and delight in an otherwise frightening place. And the music teacher who not only taught me how to do re me, but who made me realize that there were adults who would sympathize with the unreasonable fears of a child. And there was Eugene Hammett, who was the other weird kid in the fourth grade. Now, there's a difference between Eugene and me. I was weird through no fault of my own. I spoke English, as my friends in Shanghai had, with something of a British accent. I could hardly afford lunch, much less clothes, so sometimes my classmates would recognize on my back one of their own donations to charity. And on December the 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And because I was known to have come from somewhere over there, uh, the word got around that I was, might be one of them. <laughs> Eugene, on the other hand, was weird uh, by choice, or mostly by choice. I suppose he didn't choose his looks. He was a perfectly round little boy with steel-rimmed round glasses that were not made popular until John Lennon came along. <laughs> My ambition in the fourth grade was to become somehow less weird. Eugene's declared ambition was to be a ballet dancer. Now in North Carolina in 1941, <laughs> Even well-built or skinny little boys did not want to be ballet dancers when they grew up. 
Now, sometimes outcasts despise even each other, but Eugene and I did not. We were friends for the rest of the fourth grade and all of the fifth, sixth, and seventh grades during my public school career. Calvin H. Wiley School was the only school I ever went to for much more than a year at a time. And by the time Eugene and I were in the seventh grade, I had fulfilled my modest ambition. I was no longer regarded as particularly weird. Eugene, on the other hand, continued to march, or I should say dance, to a different drummer. We moved that summer. I grew up at last and had a full, rich life, in which people loved me and didn't call me names, at least not to my face. But from time to time over the years, I would think of Eugene and worry about him. Whatever could have happened to my chubby little friend whose burning ambition was to become a ballet dancer? Decades passed, the scene changed, and the Patterson family was now living in Norfolk, Virginia. And our son David had become a serious actor. But in order to get the parts he wanted, he realized he had to take dancing lessons. Even in 1983, little boys in Norfolk, Virginia did not generally aspire to become ballet dancers. So David asked me how he could take lessons without the rest of the soccer team knowing about it. <laughs> My friend Catherine Morton's daughter took ballet. So I said to Catherine, David needs to take ballet lessons, but he's not eager for all his buddies to know about it. Do you have any recommendations? Well, said Catherine, if he's really serious, Gene Hammond at Tidewater Ballet is the best teacher anywhere around. Of course, you might find him a bit strange, but w w wait a minute, I said. Gene who? Hammond, she said. He sends dancers to the Joffrey in New York City Ballet and Alvin Ailey every year. He's especially good with young black dancers. Terribly hard on any kid he thinks has talent, but he'd give his life for them. Gene who? <laughs> Hammett, she says. You may have seen him around town. He's enormous, and he wears these great flowing caftans. He does look a bit weird, but he's a wonderful teacher. You don't happen to know where he came from. Well, he came here from New York. New York? He wasn't a dancer. Oh, yes, he was quite a good dancer. You wouldn't believe it, but you know it by looking at him now, but he was a fine dancer 20 some years ago. You wouldn't happen to know where he grew up. Oh, I don't know, she said, North Carolina someplace, I think. <laughs> Next time you see him, Catherine, would you ask him if he remembers anybody named Catherine Wummeldorf from Calvin H. Wiley School? Some days later, the phone rings. Catherine? An unknown male voice says, this is Gene Hammett. Eugene, I said, do you remember me? I even remember a joke you told me in the fourth grade. <laughs> you why, if you were born in China, you were Chinese, <laughs> and you said, if a cat's born in a garage, does it make it an automobile? <laughs> and, and what about you? You danced in New York, and now you're a famous teacher of ballet? It's hard to imagine. You're, you were a little round boy the last time I saw you. Well, he says, now I'm a big round man. <laughs> I saw Eugene several times after that, and he was indeed a big round man. But I also saw pictures of him leaping like Baryshnikov off the boards of a New York stage. And even though I never got to know him when he was slim and gorgeous and at the height of his career, I wouldn't give anything for knowing that it happened as he had dreamed it would, back when we were both weird little nine-year-olds at Calvin H. Wiley School. Eugene died several years ago, but I will never forget him. 
He's a mythical hero to me, straight out of the hero stories of ancient days. The unlikely child who with cleverness and determination outwits dragons and monsters. Against all the odds, he achieves the prize and then returns to give good things to those about him. His is this pudgy, bespeckled face among Joseph Campbell's hero of a thousand faces. And I'm sure that no one in the fourth grade at Calvin H. Wiley School would have voted for Eugene, or for me, for that matter, to be the most likely to succeed. <laughs> now I think, having heard this story about Eugene, you might want to ask why I have never made Eugene a character in one of my books. I tried more than once, but it never worked. And it was all Eugene's fault. He was too much, too, too complex to squeeze between pages of a book. As I often tell students, I can't put real people in books because real people are unbelievable and characters in books have to be believable. I heard a story once, and because I didn't rush to write it down, I can't remember where I heard it or read it. The person telling the story said that he was talking to a group of children and he asked them to write down the names of their personal heroes. Some wrote down the names of sports or entertainment figures. Some wrote down the names of parents or other relatives. A few wrote down the names of political leaders, mostly dead ones. One girl turned in a blank paper. When he asked her about it, she shrugged. She didn't have any heroes, she said. It was only later that he realized the problem. She thought that heroes must be perfect human beings. She knew from the media all the sins and foibles of the famous. She had learned from hard experience that no one she knew was close to being perfect. So how could any of them be a hero? We live in an age that delights in tearing down rather than building up, where once in our country historical figures like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln were glorified, now they're made fun of for their false teeth or bad habits or their contributions are dismissed because they themselves did not live up to the high ideals that they espoused. How can the great Henry Thoreau be a hero? While he was supposedly living the simple life close to nature at Walden Pond, his mother was washing and ironing his shirts. <laughs> But human beings are neither to be glorified nor dismissed. And the same goes for the people who live in books. If Jess is an unlikely hero because he is fearful, then Gilly Hopkins is an unlikely hero because she is not a model of good behavior. Maybe we need to rethink our whole concept of the hero. I did when I met a different kind of hero in a nonfiction book that many of you have, I hope, already read. My husband bought four copies of this book and sent one to each of our children, as it was a book he wanted everyone to read. The title of the book is Mountains Beyond Mountains, with a subtitle, The Quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, a man who would cure the world by Tracy Kidder. The book is Kidder's account of a brilliant doctor who is giving his life to a tiny hospital in Haiti, certainly the most desperately needy country in the Western Hemisphere. But because he is so brilliant and perhaps a little crazy, Paul Farmer is also pioneering new cures for multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis in Peru and Russia. 
as well as finding lower priced drugs for HIV AIDS while commuting to Massachusetts to teach at Harvard Medical School. The man never seems to sleep, but in the midst of this multi-continent hectic schedule, it is the individual patient that farmer cares most desperately about. In his book, Kidder describes going with Paul Farmer to make a house call on a TB patient. Dr. Farmer wants to make sure the patient is taking his medicine to get to the shot, the shack where the patient lives, they must hike for seven hours over the literal mountains beyond mountains that make up the heart of Haiti. It is just the kind of trip that Farmer gets criticized for, a two-day trip to see what ends up being a couple of patients. But to Farmer, this care for every single patient is his reason for being. During this seemingly endless trek, Kidder asked Farmer about the $20,000 his organization spent to take a boy from Haiti to Boston for treatment, which in the end did not save the boy's life. Kidder remarks that one of Farmer's Boston co-workers had said it was a shame that they had spent so much, given all the other good things that amount of money could have done. Yeah, says Farmer, but there's so many ways of saying that. For example, why didn't the airplane company that makes money pay for his flight? That's a way of saying it. Or how about this way? How about if I say, I have fought for my whole life a long defeat? How about that? How about if I said, that's all it adds up to is defeat? I have fought the long defeat and brought other people on to fight the long defeat. And I'm not going to stop because we keep losing. You know, he goes on to say, People from our background, we're used to being on the victory team. And actually what we're trying to do here is to make common cause with the losers. We want to be on the winning team, but at the risk of turning our backs on the losers, no, it's not worth it. So you fight the long defeat. Here in Dr. Farmer's story, we can see that it's not winning that makes a person a hero. It is making common cause with the losers. It is never turning one's back on the poor, the dispossessed, the powerless. It is Gandhi, it is Jesus, it is Martin Luther King Jr. It is, I dare say, some of you in this very room tonight. Which brings me finally to the reason we're gathered here. My book, Bread and Roses Too, is about people who were engaged in fighting the long defeat. The struggle of the working poor for a living wage has been going on for centuries, and the battle is far from won, even in our own rich land. My story begins in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912, when about 25,000 textile workers from more than 30 countries, speaking at least 45 languages, united in what has become known as the strike for bread and roses. And while the numbers and the name of the strike are in dispute, the heroism of the strikers is not in doubt. I first became interested in this history when I saw a picture taken in what for 28 years was my hometown of Barrie. Standing on the granite steps of the old Socialist Labor Hall in Barrie are 35 children and four adults. The caption below the picture reads, children from the Lawrence, Massachusetts strike come to Barrie. 
There's a story in that picture, I said to myself, and then set about finding out what that story was. If there were ever unlikely heroes in the world, surely the textile workers of Lawrence in the winter of 1912 are among them. We have to assume that the very reason the mill owners of Lawrence went to the poor regions of Europe to recruit them from so many countries, speaking so many languages, was so that they could have very cheap labor that could never unite in a strike. It was sort of the Tower of Babel in reverse. You begin with a babel of voices and build your empire upon their inability to communicate. But the workers of Lawrence proved them wrong. They did communicate, they did unite, and they did prevail. By the time I had immersed myself in the story, I was overcome with admiration for these unlikely heroes. I wanted to tell the world about them. My only fear was that I would not be able to tell a fictional story worthy of their historic triumph. In my story, Rosa, the child of a mill worker, is desperately trying to keep her mother and sister from taking part in the strike. After all, her teacher has warned her that the strike leaders are godless anarchists, communists even, who will foment violence and nothing will be gained and everything lost if the workers persist in their protest. Tell Anna not to go out, Mama, please. But Mama refused to stop her. She goes with Mrs. Marino. Well, Mrs. Marino has a hot temper. You know that, Mama. Mama gave a laugh that turned into a cough. I go too as soon as I stop shaking and the barking, she said. Please, Mama, you and Anna must strike. You might get hurt. The mobs will get violent. She couldn't say what she was really thinking. What will we eat? How will we pay the rent? Mama knew all the same. Rosa. They short the pay two hours every week. That is five loaf of bread we don't have no more. I work, my children starve. I go out to strike, my children starve. Whatever I do, they starve. It's better to fight and starve than work and starve. Yes? Rosa struggled to make a better argument, anything to keep her mama and sister safe, but the baby was crying and she couldn't think straight. Now, go help Granny with Ricky. Be some use, smart school girl. I got to be there tomorrow to meet Mr. Joe Etor. He's going to help us win. If you ask me what is my favorite scene in the book, I suppose I'll have to point to one that's wholly fictional. I chose to invent a story about the poster calling for bread and roses, too, for which no objective evidence exists. In my own defense, I admit that in the historical notes, but they are at the end of the book and the story's in the center of the book. <laughs> Here it is. Rosa has just returned from mass. And here's the, from the next room, yet another gathering of the neighborhood women. Rosa plucked down on the edge of her bed and took off her sodden shoes. Her feet were freezing. She rubbed her toes to try to get the circulation going. What wouldn't she give for a new pair of shoes? I'd sell my soul, she thought, and was immediately filled with panic. No, no, she hadn't meant that. Rosa, is that true? At least Mama had noticed she was home sometimes during the past week. Rosa had wondered if Mama even knew she was alive or cared. Rosa, come here. We need some good school girl English. Reluctantly, Rosa stood up. The floor was cold under her bare, aching feet. Come on, quick, we need you. Then to the others, Rosa, right, good as school teacher, eh, Rosa? Rosa blushed to hear Mama bragging. Oh, Rosina Bambina, come here. Mrs. Marina grabbed Rosa to her big bosom and kissed her on both cheeks. Growing up you are. What grace Rosa now? Six. Rosa mumbled, embarrassed by the display. What's she say? Miss Marina asked. I don't hear so good. Too much a banging in the mill. Six, said Mama loudly. 
first in her class, too. That's a fine girl, Miss Marino said, beaming at Rosa and kissing her again sadly. Now, now, come, come, you, you sit. She turned to the women occupying the kitchen's two chairs. Up, up, give our school a chair. Both women stood. No, no, not you, Miss Petrosky. You got the bad legs. Miss Petrosky sat down again. Here, Rosa, right here. She put her hands on Rosa's shoulder and pushed her down in the chair nearest the table. In front of where Rosa sat down was a large white rectangle of pasteboard. Beside the pasteboard was a bottle of ink, her ink. Rosa noted, feeling a twinge of resentment that someone had dared raid her precious school supplies. And a brush about an inch wide. Okay, said Ms. Maria. You see, we got to make a big sign for tonight to take you to the train station. You got to be, it got to be good message and very nice handwriting. We need you, smart girl, do it for us, okay? Could she tell Mrs. Marina and the others that she hated the strike? That she wanted no part of making a big sign for it? She should, but she knew she wouldn't. She was such a coward. And Mama had bragged. So all she said was, what do you want the sign to say? We're thinking, we're thinking, something very good. All eyes were on Mrs. Marina, everyone quiet. It was a solemn moment. Okay, now you see, they give one piece only. So only one sign. So got to be really, really good. The best sign in parade, eh? All the women nodded agreement. Yes, yes, the best sign. Mrs. Marina continued. We want Mr. Big Bill Hayward to see our sign soon as he step off the train. We want all the newspaper men from big city New York and Boston to see our sign. She leaned so close to Rosa that Rosa could smell the old sweat clinging to her dress. Now, Rosa, you've got to write very big, very nice letters, so Mr. Big Bill Hayward read them even from the train window, right? So he knows we are somebody, even before he get off the train at the depot. Okay? Rosa nodded. What else was she to do? Now, ladies, what we say on our side. For a moment, they were startled. Wasn't it Mrs. Marino's job to come up with the big ideas? We say, said Mrs. Jaracella, hesitantly, one eye on Mrs. Marino. We say, they want bread. That's number one, okay? We gotta have bread. See, see, said Mrs. Marino, plainly disappointed. But it's not good enough. Everyone write that. It's nobody don't want bread. We want bread is good sign. It's true sign, Miss Petrosky protested shyly. The others murmured in agreement, but Mrs. Marino pinned Rosa's right wrist to the table lest she think the matter was settled and began to write too soon. Then Rosa felt a familiar hand rest lightly on her hair and began to stroke it. She looked up into Mama's face. The room was silent, watching. Mama played with a curl on Rosa's shoulder. I think she began quietly. I think we want not just bread for our bellies. We want more than only bread. We want food for our hearts, our souls. We want, how to say it, we want, you know, Puccini music. We want for our beautiful children some beauty. She leaned over and kissed the curl on her finger. We want roses. There was a murmur while Mama's words were interpreted for the non-English speakers, then a ripple of sighs as each understood. Now all the women, even Mrs. Marina, were looking at Mama with something like awe in their eyes. Then Anna said, that's beautiful, Mama. 
but it's much too long for our little sign. Mama shook her head as though her mind was coming back from a countryside beyond Naples, where she remembered beauty. See, see, too long. But Rosa fix it, hey Rosa? Mrs. Marina loosened her grip on Rosa's wrist, and Rosa picked up the brush and reached toward the ink pot. All the women leaned toward the table. She could hear their noisy breathing and smell their fetid clothing. No, no, Miss Marina shouted, spreading her arms wide. Back, back, I'll give her room. Don't want to touch the table, no one. They obeyed, even Mama stepped back. Rosa dipped the brush and carefully wiped the excess ink on the rim of the pot. She took a deep breath, which was echoed through the kitchen and held as she put the brush down on the white pasteboard and began to form the first words. The lettering so clean that even her teacher, Miss Finch, would have been forced to admire it. We want bread, she wrote on the first line. Everyone who could read English nodded and murmured the words to the others. Yes, yes, of course, they wanted bread. And roses, too. Mama gave a little gasp, but Rosa was not finished. One more dip, and she put a perfectly curved comma between roses and two. In case, just in case, Miss Finch were to see the sign. <laughs> and marvel that these innocent foreigners should know enough to insert a comma. Careful not to drip, she replaced the brush and the pot. Meantime, Anna was reading the second line aloud and then the whole sign. Something like a little cheer went up and everyone leaned in for a closer look at the masterpiece. No, no, Miss Marina yelled, spreading her arms out once again. It's a silhouette, don't touch nobody. It's a very small, oh, Rosa Pampina Mia. It's the best sign nobody ever made. She took Rosa's head in both her big red hands and kissed the part in her hair. She was weeping for joy. There were tears in Mama's eyes as well. Don't I say she's top of class? The world, as we know it, is filled with what appears, appears to be endless struggles. Struggles against poverty, against injustice, against oppression of many kinds. But those who are willing to engage in these struggles to make common cause with the losers are heroes in the mode of Paul Farmer and the textile workers of Florence that winter of 1912. Heroes of the long defeat. We have to remember the years of apartheid. And the picture that comes vividly to mind is that of Nelson Mandela languishing in prison for 27 years. When he was finally released, a journalist asked him if he didn't hate his captors for the suffering that caused him. Yes, he said, for the first 13 years, I hated them. But then one day I realized that they could take away everything I had except my mind and my heart. I would have to give those away and I would refuse to do that. And so for 14 years, he grew the soul that would lead his country to a powerful revolution, a peaceful revolution. He refused to re embrace violence and revenge, to become like his captors. He was a true hero of the long defeat, which turned unbelievably, almost miraculously, into a kind of victory over hatred, a triumph the world had not seen the likes of before. There's another story I love, which comes from the era of South Africa's long defeat. Jim Wallace tells this story in his best-selling book, God's Politics. Bishop Tutu was preaching that Sunday morning in St. George's Cathedral. As usual, the congregation had had to brave the line of armed police that always surrounded the cathedral on a Sunday morning, but they had gathered, as they bravely did, each week 
to worship. While Bishop Tutu was preaching, however, a large group of police actually invaded the sanctuary, circling the con congregation, waiting, it appeared, for the bishop or the congregation to say or do something that they could be arrested for. You can imagine the fear that gripped the people. The sanctuary had been violated. Apparently, there were no limits to what the apartheid regime was prepared to do to silence protesters. The bishop abrupt, abruptly stopped his sermon and for a few long moments stared at each invader in turn. Finally, he spoke in his quiet, almost playful voice. You are strong. You are very strong, he said. But we worship one who is stronger than you. Why don't you just join the winning side? The congregation who, until that moment, had been frozen in fear, stood up and quite spontaneously began to dance. Before long, they had danced their way past the invaders, dancing out the great doors into the courtyard, dancing right through the police line which surrounded the cathedral and into the streets beyond. No one was arrested. The police simply didn't know how to deal with enemies of the state who were dancing in the face of oppression. Bill, Big Bill Hayward said of the 1912 strike, the women, won the strike. Those singing women, can't you picture them? The authorities didn't know what to do with those women, singing as they marched for justice for themselves and bread and roses for their children. In many ways, all of us who care for and work for the children of the world are fighting the long defeat. There's no guarantee that we will live to see the day on which children on every continent will have enough food, clean water and shelter, lives free from war, from the threat of violence and disease, much less proper schools to go to and books to enrich their spirits and expand their imaginations. As you know all too well, we haven't come close to achieving these aims in our own country. But in, as imperfect as we all are, as fearful as we often are, remember, friends, that we are making common cause with children. They are the powerless. They are the losers in this tragic world their elders have made. As daunting as this task is, we must not, for their sake, surrender to despair or cynicism. Instead, staring into the very face of power, greed, and criminal indifference, let us join hands to become the unlikely dancing heroes of the long defeat. And thank you for joining me in that day. questions if you'd like to. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Oh. Now, there's another <clears throat> aspect of, I love Richard and absolutely loved him. 
and, um, and, and the, the trauma that people are going through and knowing their lives can be ruined, still willing to do it and all come together. But the other aspect that amazed me, and this happened in World War II, the parents trusting, sending their children to Pharaoh. Yeah. The parents trusting that the Italians there will take care of the kids. And, and in, in World War II, the Jewish families had no choice. But all these English farmers took these kids in. The Huguenots in France, you know, a number of them took Jewish children in. And then um, this woman uh, from Oregon, um, or, or, or Iris Oregon, taking all these children in from, no matter where they came from, from cities that had been bombed. They were, the parents didn't have any choice. They thought the children I was so impressed with the generosity of the of the, the Italians in there uh, that I discovered more and more about the strike itself and felt that the book had to begin there. Yes. Uh, but um, uh, I don't know if it, could everybody hear the comments about the uh, the parents being willing to trust their kids on this trip. And there were two reasons why they did it. First of all. The kids were hungry and cold, <laughs> uh, and the workers in New York and, and in Barry, the first two places they went with New York City and, and Barry, uh, had promised to care for them. And uh, the, in Barry, even before the children came, they were having fundraisers at the labor hall to send money to the strikers. And they were also, the reason they didn't, literally start to death was because uh, uh, union members in other parts of New England were sending vats of soup and, and uh, money yes. uh, to, the, to the workers. But there was a, another reason besides the care of the children that was uh, behind this, and, and part of that was because they knew if they sent the children out, the newspapers would get involved. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, uh, in fact, the turning point in the strike comes when Philadelphia workers offered to take children. And the, uh, that's just in the book. It's, it's taking place off, <laughs> off stage, but it's I, I, I related in the book. Uh, the mothers and the children uh, went to the train station, and the um, mothers were beaten from jail, and the kids were taken away. And, I'm not sure where the kids were. They were, I mean, they didn't have a foster care system in place, but uh, they had something. And so the, for a long time, they didn't know where their children were. Uh, and that really brought the newspapers in and shamed the city so much that, that they uh, began to, that, and the mill owners, that they came to the negotiating table. Uh, so, uh, never underestimate the power of the media. <laughs> it almost sounds like what just as recently happened. Oh, I'm afraid we're too close, too close to the present, except we were doing that. And of course, you know, the one thing that I don't tell in the book, I don't think even in the author's notes I tell, which I find is the saddest part of this whole story. Um, the, these workers want, got everything they asked for at the negotiating table. It was the most successful strike almost in American labor history because they, the workers got everything they asked for, and of course they should have asked for a lot more. Uh, but they did get everything they asked for. You think be a source of great pride. Oh, you know, remember the story about the young woman who was scalped by the machine? Uh, she was, and several other workers, uh, because uh, President Taft, the newspapers aroused Washington. And so he, there was a congressional hearing, and uh, this young woman and Several other workers were invited to testify 
to a congressional committee. Mrs. Taft entertained them at tea in the White House. How many of you had heard about the strike before you read the book? You'd heard about the strike. Not many people have, to tell you the truth. Maybe because you live in this area, you'd heard more than most people in this country do. It doesn't appear in a lot of history books. Uh, a, a reporter in the 60s realized that not much was known about the strike. And so he decided to kind of dig into the story of the strike. And someone told him that the daughter of this young woman who had been scalped was still alive. And he was thrilled because he was going to get a first-hand story. She had never heard the story, her mother's story. And she said, well, Mama always liked me to comb her hair, and she wanted me to comb over the ball spot, but she never told me why she had the ball spot. Now, if I had been scalped by a machine, if I had been asked to testify before a congressional committee, if I had been invited to tea by the first lady to the White House, you bet my kids would have known about it. <laughs> but after the strike was over, the church made the strikers feel that they had been unreligious because they had sided with these anarchists and communists in the course of the strike. The city made them feel that they had been unpatriotic because they had uh, so had worked against the system and defied the laws. And so they became ashamed of what they accomplished and they never talked about it. So that's why, why there's been so, until recently, so little written about the strike. Yes? Is there a work that you recommend about the labor movement in Vermont and the story that you tell? Is there a particular historical work that you'd recommend? I'm not knowledgeable enough to tell you which. <laughs> of but there are books about, of course, the uh, mills, especially uh, in the Burlington area, you know, all, all the mills that were there. Uh, and and uh, the good bit has been written about uh, the rag workers in in the Barry area. I don't know. Uh, did anybody else help this gentleman know about some more books about labor in Vermont? Labor movement. Uh, Dick Hathaway is no longer with us. He's the person we should have all asked because he knew everything about uh, the labor, labor in Vermont. Vermont History Center very probably gives the I'm sorry. Vermont History Center very gives the They have historians that work in the Vermont History Center very. Sure. Um, very hard to hear. You have to help me. So, the Vermont History Center in Barry would help. Yes, yes, that's a good place to go to start. You know, Vermont History Center. Which is, if you haven't been in that building, it's so beautifully restored. Uh, it's worth a trip just to see uh, the stained glass and the woodwork and the plaster carvings. And, and even in small towns, there are history books. Like in our town of Rygate, there is some um, uh, sections on the union and the formation of the union oh, and right. how the people forming the union were sent to jail. And this is in the granite industry. Mm -hmm. And the people in the town who helped bail them out and save them by contributing to the costs. Oh, that's wonderful. I didn't know that story. That's great. Did you all hear that? Uh, in Rage, um, there were. And they were it was granite there yeah, too. The granite. They formed the union, and so they were the union leaders, I suppose, were put in jail. And then the people. There were people in the town yeah. 
who had enough money that helped bail them out and help them in their cause. Oh, that's, that's great. That's, yeah. that's, that's the kind of heritage you'd like to hear at your town. <laughs> yeah. Very loud for me. In your book, you uh, reference several times the Harvard boys that come to sort of be strike breakers. What role did they actually play? I had the impression that Harvard was more of a bastion of liberal thinking back then, but I gather they actually were not. They were trying to help break the strike? The, yeah, the Harvard, yeah. They, they brought them in like a little National Guard or something. They were, they were just constrict, uh, you know, they needed people to, to uh, keep these singing women in line. So, so they got Harvard boys and, and gave them guns and bayonets and said, you know, make these people behave. Not a great, glorious history. <laughs> myself very well and, <laughs> and there's more of the nine-year-old that wasn't, working, wasn't a success at Calvin A. Wiley School. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I mean, it's lovely for people to like your books and I really like that. But the rest of you just sort of think, well, you know, another year somebody else would have won. <laughs> oh, it's, I love, I love the fact that I write books that people love to read. Mm -hmm. That makes me very, very happy. Is that, is that answer your question? <laughs> I, I'm quite taken with the fact that both you and your male friend became so successful when you were so bullied and put down. <laughs> this doesn't happen always. No, no, well, people react differently, don't they, too? I, yes, I think you either do. I'm getting out of this. I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> yeah. Or you just give into it and believe them. Yeah. But I just, I just think that is such a great story. Well, it, it is a great story, and, and it just, you know, I just wouldn't give it anything. I, that's one reason I keep telling Eugene's story, because I just think it's wonderful. Um, what he accomplished is amazing. But the fact that I could find out about it just seemed to wear to me. Yeah. To find him again when we were both. And then for your son. <laughs> So, so uh, in fact, before he died, he was going to do a ballet of, out of Bruce Jarevithia, but he never finished it. So he was going to choreograph it for a ballet, but, um, which I would have loved, but that didn't happen because he died. Mm -hmm. You know, I was struck by, um, at the end, you were talking about how, you know, we have to help with the children. Don't have the power and don't have. And Rosa in the story was so afraid. Mama, don't do this. Don't go out there. You're, we're not going to have food. Da, da, da. And what that group of women ended up doing was, with her fear, bringing her into the with her fear, bringing her into the process, into what was happening by her skill of being able to write the sign. And I was thinking about the children now in schools who may be fearful that someone's going to come in with a gun and kill them or whatever. And maybe, maybe the importance of bringing the children with their fear, if they're in fear, into the adult process of what's happening and how we deal with mm. all this. Well, it doesn't help to, to keep them out. You know, I think one of the saddest things that happens to a child is to be excluded when they're when the adults are afraid or mourning and they say well the, the child is too young to understand or we were going to protect the child from it and of course you can't protect them from it um, it, 
it just, they just have to be, to bear it and it becomes toxic. I mean, all of us have friends who, I, mean, I certainly have a friend whose father died when he was six years old and he was not allowed to go to the funeral, he was not allowed to mourn because he was too young. And so he, he's still trying to mourn the death of his father. Maybe use the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, to exclude children from adult fear or mourning is a disservice to the child because the child is going to feel very deeply but be told that his feelings, I mean, his feelings would be discounted because of course he's just a kid so he couldn't possibly understand or couldn't possibly feel. And I get a lot of criticism from adults who say that my books are too intense for children because children don't feel that way and I get letters from children thanking me for understanding how they feel. Uh, and, I, and, they, and kids will say to me, just, how do you know how we feel? And I said, I was once a child. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I don't think I have a great memory for events, but I think I have a good emotional memory. I, I, I can remember how things felt, and I know how intensely children feel. And that's why I told them my books feel very intensely. Yes? You develop some wonderful characters in the story. And one of the, one of the biggest surprises to me, because I didn't like him at first, was the father of Rose's Vermont family, uh -huh. who came out as a wonderful character in the story. What yeah. was your inspiration for some of those characters? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I, I do love him very much. And um, there again, you know, you, you think, what, what's gone into this man that's made him so, so that you didn't like him initially, his, his devastation about losing his own child and also losing his mentor. Uh, so, you know, he's had, he's had a little more pain than he should have had to have in his life. And, uh, and yet he's, a, he's basically a wonderful man. And, and he, in a way, Jake's, Jake's awfulness <laughs> brought out his compassion. And, um, um, I, you know, people ask me how I respond, and I, you know, in the final scene when he, he says, well, you know, we'll buy new gloves next year. It doesn't matter. I mean, they, no, he shouldn't have his gloves too big. He should have gloves that fit, and next year we'll get another pair. And giving Jake that hope for his future, just in the way he talked about it getting another pair of gloves for him. Um, and you know, I, I, I read the last couple of pages of the book and I always cry because, um, and I cry because he just took about his heart, you know? So, uh, I love these people. You know, I think somebody asked me about creating characters and I think, they're not a retro set. <laughs> You don't make up characters, you get to know people. And, and uh, that's one reason you write more than one draft, because each time you know them better. And you realize, well, no, he would never have said that. I'm, I know him better now. I know, you know, he would do this, or she would do that, or she wouldn't do this, or she wouldn't do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, when I was... I came to writing quite late, and, and I would listen to writers talk about their work, and I thought I would sit there and go, well, if I ever get to be a writer, I'm not going to talk hokey. Talk hokey. Uh, because it's a mysterious process you're involved in. And, uh, you know, you said, where did that character come from? I don't know. This character just sort of appeared, and I 
have tried to describe him. Uh, and, and people said, you know, they asked about Jake, and I said, well, because I love Barry, um, I wanted a child who could stay in Barry. But I knew that all of the children, the actual children who came, came from loving families. Uh, they would have to go back, of course, and they would want to go back. I need to have a child that nobody cared if he came back. Uh, and for whom Barry would have come home. So I, I invented one. <laughs> when you get to the end of your writing of a book, do you miss them as much as I miss when I read them? I want to stay with them. I have difficulty. <laughs> Good. Going back to I don't miss them, because I always have them. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's always, after you finish a book, there's always this sort of, for me, this energy that you don't know what to do with. And um, we, we lived in Norfolk when I finished Jacob Fell Off, and that was such an emotional book to write. And I finished it and, and sent it off, and I was just like this, you know, I've got to do something, I've got to do something. So I thought, well, that screen door uh, needs to be replaced. I'll replace the screen door. And I went down to Barbara's store, and I got myself a screen door, and I put it on. It never closed properly. <laughs> my husband tried to fix it, it didn't work. My sons tried to fix it, it didn't work. My father, who could fix anything, tried to do it, fix it, didn't work. And every time John went out, you know John, so <laughs> every time he went out the door, then he'd have to come back and shut the screen door, because it would never automatically shut after. Him. And he would say words that no minister should have been saying. <laughs> and I said, look, I said, you ought to be grateful. I finished that book, and I had to do something with it, and I put on that screen door. I, you know, a lot of writers just go off on a three-day drunk. And he said, <laughs> And he said, yeah, and the drunk would have lasted three days, and this door has been on here for several years. <laughs> I don't know whether that meant